It's December. The snow has fallen up here in Wisconsin, and Series 67 is freshly fallen into your podcasting feeds with this first episode. Welcome, everyone, to our special holiday season series. We are going to be covering the Santa Corps with the designer Taylor Curry Smith in this series, and we certainly make some really amazing choices for our characters. But before we get to this episode where we learn all about this game, here's what to expect in our calls to action after the show. Join us back here to hear one last time about the Starcrossed expansion crowdfunding campaign. We aren't getting paid to talk about it, but we love this game so much. And it's really great to see even more love brought into this world by backing this game. Um, we'll also be covering the normal podcast ending stuff and thanking our patrons and figuring out what sort of present A3 Sketchpad left for us this time. <laughs> yep. Until then, enjoy the show, everybody. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, a show where we discuss and create characters, the best part of role-playing games, with guests using their favorite systems. I am one of your hosts, Ryan, and this episode, my co-host Amelia and I are excited to welcome Taylor Currysmith from Whimsy Machine Media to talk about his game, The Santa Corps, a festive holiday TTRPG about dismantling systemic greed. Welcome to Character Creation Cast, Taylor. We are, we're so excited. We're like, like seriously, so excited about this. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for having me. No, I'm excited to talk about it. Can you start by telling us um, who you are along with your pronouns, where people can find you, what you're working on, all that kind of stuff. Um, Tell us everything. Yeah, <laughs> everything. So it all began uh, uh, decades ago. Um, no, uh, so I'm Taylor. I use he, him pronouns. And I, I previously published under Taylor Smith. Um, then I got married and tried to figure out what SEO made sense. Um, changed my last name. Uh, legally, I'm Taylor Curry. I'm still publishing as uh, Taylor Curry Smith. So that's uh, what the game is published under. Mostly there it's just go. through Whimsy Machine Media. Um, I am largely in the TTRPG space doing uh, different games. I started with uh, Spell the RPG, which is the tabletop role playing game that uses letter tiles for the like what you spell is what you cast uh, type Ooh. of magic system. And that was kind of my debut in 2015, 2016. Um, and then I've just been making stuff since. I recently started getting into some fiction journals because uh, I want to start writing my own stories instead of just making frameworks for people to tell their own stories in. Mm. I like that. Well, let's go ahead and get into this. And we're going to start by discussing what this game is all about. What's in a game? So what is the core concept of the Santa Core? Um, the, so the, the core concept of it is um, the war on Christmas has escalated until Christmas took over the entire year. Um, oh. And then corporate greed got ahead of itself. Christmas ends up collapsing. Revolutionaries fight against uh, Christmas and, and the Christmas empire event eventually toppling it and now it's a future dystopia where christmas is forbidden and the players are uh different classic christmas characters like little toy soldiers or tiny reindeer or elves or abominable snowmen what have you or a uh, ghost burdened by the chains of their past and <laughs> they go on these missions to you know help a young orphan find the, the meaning of belief or terrorize billionaires to uh have some empathy again those sorts of things you know christmas things <laughs> <laughs> Having just rewatched again Muppet Christmas Carol last night, I'm so uh -huh. excited for this. <laughs> I'm yeah. so excited the, uh, for this. The only the, version of Christmas Carol I care about is the Muppet version. 
the the preamble is written uh, from the perspective of well, he introduces himself as the Timothy Santa Timothy now because they you have taken the title of of Santa to, for what he used to represent before the clause became empire, mm-hmm. and it was uh they 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 once called him tiny, uh, and I remember when Christmas was about haunting specters, <laughs> harassing the rich until they repented. I'm like, yeah, mm-hmm. that's yeah. what Christmas is about. It's true. That's what Christmas is about. <laughs> <laughs> so can you tell us a little bit about the setting of this game? So you mentioned that it's like in a world where sort of Christmas has taken over the whole kind of year. Are we playing in like a dystopian future kind of thing? Or is it just like what if or can you make it whatever you want? You really can make it whatever you want. Um, the the preamble and uh that's mostly what you get out of the setting it talks about a brief run of the history of christmas having taken over and then collapsing the the christmas empire as it was called uh santa's workshop santa himself uh that all collapsed into the ocean um and is is destroyed clean slate uh but it's really dark yeah no it's it's really dark well and and something that i enjoyed writing it is so i i also try to have a sense of humor throughout um so it's it's dark but it's I try to be dark comedy with it. It's not just like grim dark for the sake of grim dark. Um, yeah. but it's also a, a game designed, uh, graphically in Canva with cute little Christmas graphics and like yeah. fun little <laughs> holiday characters, uh, about how, um, <laughs> Without the veneer of Christmas, corporate greed just runs rampant. So because they're no longer pretending, um, they are just buy, commodify. Mm-hmm. And and so there are still the same problems of greed that need to be fought against. It's just uh, kind of reclaiming the sense of, of charity and generosity that is supposed to exist uh, and was supposed to have exist with Christmas that um, was was destroyed in, in this past war. But in terms mm-hmm. of what exists in this world, it's totally up to the players um, how fantastical or how magical it kind of implies that the supernatural sort of things like uh, frost spirits and abominable snowmen, they exist in kind of a realm outside. It's very um, Rise of the Guardians, uh, I guess, okay. where, you know, mm-hmm. you have like maybe a child can see you. Um, there's actually a option to play a human who just happens to be able to see you kind of get whisked up in this but like those holiday movies where it's kind of like the normal world until you get whisked up into this holiday adventure but once the adventure is over you're kind of back to regular life except regular Mm -hmm. life in this setting is kind of like that fear mongering of what if the war on christmas wins um Mm -hmm. just because like i always love that uh um, happy war on christmas what are people mad about this year um, oh my gosh yeah like a couple of years ago when the starbucks cups were plain red and they were like it's not christmas yes. enough now it's just red and i was like but oh, okay that's really like I, I don't know do we not have so many better things to do like uh, i i want to live the kind of privileged life where that's the stuff i'm worried about honestly right yes yeah that like and, and so that's it's very much channeling that idea that those those people became in charge um and they're awful um yeah. mm-hmm. <laughs> I, I recently found out that the uh, abbreviation xmas dates back to like the 1600s or something like mm-hmm. that um oh. because that was another one of those like our war on christmas xmas we can't say the the Christ in Christmas, uh, it's yeah. the, 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 the seculars are winning. Um, it's like, no, X but, has been shorthand for Christ for a long time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That one always amused me. <laughs> yeah. So what tools do we need to play this game then? Uh, the PDF, a deck of cards, standard 52 playing cards, well, plus two jokers. Um, mm-hmm. So standard 54 deck of playing cards mm-hmm. and two 10 sided dice commonly referred to as D tens. Uh, and that should do. Yeah. Nice and easy. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I like I like to keep some stuff kind of especially games like this. Um, I have some other games that uh, I've kind of taken it upon myself to let's use as many dice as we can or let's well, use yeah, a giant bag of fun. scrabble tiles. Um, right. Yeah, uh, but for, for things like this, um, I really like decks of cards as RNG or the number generators because um, there's a lot of variability and then you, there's a lot of stuff you can do with suits. Mm hmm. But in, in terms of like, it's kind of like rolling a 4D10 or no, a 4D13 uh, in, in, a, in a fun way. Uh, so it's really easy to map the probability. Um, let me know how much you guys care about spreadsheets because I do. Um, but I know it's, <laughs> it doesn't Love necessarily make... Yeah. Okay. Very Please, cool. Go off about spreadsheets. Tell me more. <laughs> we are big fans. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I mean, for for... All of my games, I uh, build out probability spreadsheets to kind of calculate um, what the, the minimum, maximum, and average distribution of results are going to be. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so that, that goes into the planning thing, uh, the planning phase of, okay, if we're drawing X number of cards over this period of time, comparing them against like different values of dice, how are the successes breaking down? How are the uh, failures breaking down? And... Um, finding those because sometimes when you just like work in averages or like, yeah, this kind of makes sense. Or like, I, you know, I saw a game use two, two D sixes before. Um, if you start messing with the numbers too much, you might create scenarios where it's not possible or there's dice mm -hmm. rolls where they cannot fail. And once you start getting to those, you know, the mathematically boring, uh, elements, I, I think they're important because rolling dice that, you know, inherently don't matter. is like, what are we doing? Right. Right. Yeah. I, this is like a thing about games and game design and stuff like that, that I love that I'm very drawn to narrative games, but I still, I still like the probability part of it. I don't like games that sort of like don't have any dice or don't have any kind of like chance mechanic in them. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I don't like really crunchy games because I don't like where it makes me do the math. I like when the designers have done the math and they've been yeah. like, okay, this works. This does. I don't like, don't like make me add up percentages. I'm not into that. But don't like, get me started on derived stats. Oh I can't even. <laughs> mm -hmm. Every time. I'm like, here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I really like, the care that goes into that kind of stuff that it's like, I've, I've thought about it because in order for a game to be fun, you know, you do need that chance of success to be in there somewhere. And obviously depending on the kind of story you're trying to tell or the people that are playing, what that like required chance of success is can mm -hmm. vary. You know, like there are some things that should be really hard to do. There are some things that should be really easy to do. There are people who are like, I, I want to win every time, you know, but I want the chance to not, um, but I, yeah. I love the fact that like you've put that much thought into like this should happen, but it shouldn't happen all the time. So here's how we're gonna like that, right. It, it that should kind happen. Of and, goes yeah. into it. Yeah. Yeah. And and what to do when it doesn't. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Super yeah. Cool. Yeah. I love that. We've talked a little bit about like the kinds of themes there, like the you know the capitalist greed and sort of this like war on Christmas kind of thing. Um, are there other themes that you feel like are really important in this game or things that like you hope people get out of it or themes that you have found really fun to explore when you've run or played this game? Um, I think there's, I, I don't know. You, you, it has a message a little bit, but it's one of those messages like, will it ever reach anybody that doesn't already agree with that message? Right. I don't know. Yeah. Right. Um, Fair enough. Yeah, you're very upfront um, about it. So I don't know that like, people yeah, are like, picking it, it up and be like, oh. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, it, it looks cute on the outside, so maybe I'll trick some people. Uh, but um, I, th I wanted to incorporate a variety of what is fun about Christmas games, what is fun about like holiday celebrations, holiday movies, holiday shows, those sorts mm -hmm. of things, um, allowing for that same sort of critical lens, because mm -hmm. uh, I, I think there's a lot of themes where if you kind of approach it uncritically, you're not really doing it justice. Um, not to say that you can't just kind of like take it at face value too. It, it felt more fun to present some of those stereotypical things in this context. Um, 
and also it's like an inversion of an inversion. So it's like pretending that the war on Christmas won and Christmas is banned. And so it, it, it discusses both like Christmas was evil, but now Christmas is trying to be good again. Right. Um, mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. There, there's already kind of like those levels of it sort of feels like it could be a holiday special. But also um, I think there's a line where uh, – Primary infrastructure of the Christmas empire, along with the leaders of, oh no, uh, and just like that, Father Christmas, his eight tiny reindeer, and the primary infrastructure of the Christmas empire, along with the leaders of its resistance, all perished beneath the Arctic that day, right? That was, that was when the war, <laughs> right? So that's, it's distressing. When I was rereading this game before the interview, I was like, oh, I did kill the tiny reindeer. That's oh, awful. No. I called them reindeer you in did. that, like... That was a bad thing to do. You can't put that in a children's cartoon. <laughs> but there's uh, a, a, a story generator chart to kind of um, either act as inspiration. Um, I come into game design very much knowing that I have written the rules. What you do with them is kind of up to you. I yeah. can pretend that there are certain unalienable truths, but once it hits the table, it's out of my hands. Yeah. Um, so I, I think charts and things like that can be really helpful for either roll against this and come up with something random, roll against it, decide that you don't like the random stuff and change one or two things and just sort of pretend uh, Mm -hmm. or just use it as inspiration to come up with whatever you want to come up with. And when populating those charts, um, it's kind of uh, set up in a format of a noun uh, needs a thing, uh, but you know, something happened and yeah. it's a mix of like uh, a precocious young kid or, or like a, a, a greedy billionaire or, or something like that. Um, and then the things that they need are, it could be like a, an overworked journalist needs a small town baker slash carpenter, uh, but like families in town, right? That's yeah. one of the options. Mm-hmm. Or there's like a billionaire needs to break the curse, but a tithe must be paid. So there's, <laughs> there's references to like, are there dark magic demon sort of things exist in this world? Well, Maybe. I'm here. So yes. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Uh, yeah. You were welcome in this game then. Uh, yeah. Th- and, and, and so I, I wanted to have that, and, and I think more than just the two extremes, I wanted that that mix up of, okay, let's look at a, hol- a Hallmark holiday movie and let's uh, see what it looks like if we kind of make it grim and wild um, mm-hmm. or let's tell like a black comedy version of Rise of the Guardians or, or, or something like that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh I, I I think those kind of stories where if you like a certain type of Christmas movie or uh, if you like a certain type of Christmas media, you could, if not, and probably not recreate it, you could reference it, you could allude it, uh, allude to it in um, hopefully a fun way. Yeah. Yeah. And did the camera even see those reindeer perish? Well, or, we don't or know. was it happening but off screen? It was, it was yeah. all off screen, right? That's all narration. Right. right. Yeah. They they probably still they alive. landed on some kind of island or something and everything's fine. Yeah, yeah the it's island of fine. Misfit Toys. Uh, right. It's copyright, yeah. so I can't right. um, reference it specifically, <laughs> right. but, you know. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the island there. of unruly playthings. Right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the island of, yeah, like, goodwill donation pile. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> So uh, you get your scenario, you, you've got the setting. Uh, what do you do then uh, specifically as characters in this game? Um, so ahead of time, there's kind of a uh, meta in, out of character um, the planning stage of you have a mission. So you're part of the Santa Corps, which is a team of um, you know, holiday characters who are trying to do these um, missions to help foster the charity um, and and generosity and, uh, you know, the positive things that are supposed to exist in the face of uh, greed or um, uh, the veneer of cheer that's not uh, actually addressing things that need to be addressed. Whether the core is just like just you, like it's just a couple of plucky uh characters that are trying to just do whatever they can them against the world or whether it's uh you know a global organization and you're just a chapter of it um that's kind of up to you and i think that's also where a little bit of the um kind of dystopia might be how much you want to play with that theme um because i think you could address it as an organization you have resources you have the ability to uh, address these things or if you want it 
to be like we're living on the land we're revolutionaries we're you know in in the darkness because it's dangerous to exist that is a space that can be explored in the game but it's kind of totally up to you so you create Mm -hmm. these missions and um in and out of character you plan the uh steps uh the the milestones of that mission of like okay we got to find the billionaire we got to extract him from his mansion we have to uh remind him of these sins uh we have to make sure that this program that he's doing is stopped um and you know you 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 go through you, you set these um missions is kind of like planning the bank heist right Mm -hmm. where you you have your checklist of what you want to do but of course there are opportunities for that checklist to um change shift or get completely upset uh Mm. uh, along the way Mm. very cool what do you feel like is unique about this game and in particular i kind of want to ask it like what what thing were you like this needs to be a game you know like what Mm -hmm. what in your heart was like I need this to be out there. Um, so this to me was both um, mechanically kind of fun and um, the theme. So I really like the theme. And um, so it's a game that I made for a game jam that was a holiday themed game jam. And just kind of like thinking of like, how am I going to approach this holidays? This seemed like the right mood. Um, and it was a lot of fun to write. Um, there, there, it was a lot of fun to kind of like build this world and have that humor in it and uh, discuss that sort of like, like, let's make Christmas about terrorizing billionaires again, um, mm-hmm. which the sad <laughs> the part true is. Let's bring that uh, back. Yeah. <laughs> well, like, and Scrooge was probably not even a billionaire. He's probably not even like the Dickens equivalent of a millionaire. Right, like, he was right. just the he, the he boss of that like a company. Crappy landlord. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but like, yeah, let's terrorize landlords too. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, <laughs> there's. Uh, um, uh, I, I, I think it's, it's fun to, to work in that space, um, while still being unabashedly Christmassy, uh, yeah. like you can still play as elves and reindeer, either there's still the option to play as magical reindeer, um, mm-hmm. and you, you can still have fun existing in that space, but still be critical of that space. Um, and I, I think I wanted a Christmas game that wasn't just, uh, let's, uh, let's punch, punch on Christmas. It's like, no, let's, I mean, we still celebrate the holiday. It's, it's, it can still be fun. Um, but, uh, so, so having both, I I wanted both. I wanted both. Yeah. I really Um, enjoy that. It's like, it's a pro Christmas war on Christmas. Like, I, you know, yeah, I like that. I really, I, it's an interesting take on it that like, yeah. mm-hmm. yes, it's a war on Christmas, but a war on the parts of Christmas that have gone wrong. <laughs> yeah. 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 So having the humor and having the commentary was a lot of fun and a lot of fun in writing. And then mechanically, um, I enjoy the, uh, I was kind of looking at cake for a while of like, I'm going to try to figure out how to make a, like a deck builder TTRPG. And I have some plans for it, but it's like deck builders are hard. Mm-hmm. And um, yeah, especially just, if you're making spreadsheets and yeah Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um (laughs) but there's a a a lot of different spaces where um having cards playing from a hand uh because uh you you get a hand of cards and choosing how you play um kind of touching on what you were saying about randomness um i enjoy when there's randomness and i like playing with where that randomness comes in Mm -hmm. uh so it's random what cards you have in your hand but then you kind of get that um ability to pick and choose which actions are going to succeed and which actions then therefore have to fail um Mm -hmm. it's kind of like uh this system doesn't use it but i I sometimes like playing with um when you roll a die instead of that determining your success that determines like a point value where if you uh roll a four on a on a d6 you now have four action points that you can do things and so can you do all the things that you wanted to do with that role maybe maybe not but you kind of mm-hmm. choose where that failure comes in yeah um there's a i when i'm designing games i really try to think about what does this look like at the table um and what is the feeling that happens when this happens and Mm -hmm. uh something that that i come back to a lot is my experience um myself and then and seeing others of when you roll dice and then nothing happens when it's either like a failure and you're like well 
nothing happened. I guess that was my turn. And you move mm-hmm. on. I think there, there can it's be a place for that. It's one of my hills to die on, honestly, is yeah. like, don't roll if nothing's going to happen. It's just like, right. don't, it, like, there's nothing more awful than like, oh, I'm going to roll to like, you know, inspect this thing. Okay, a success. There's nothing there. Like, well, then right. just tell me. Just tell me that. I didn't uh, need to, you know. Uh, oh. I, have, mm. I have a very tiny game called uh, Everyone Roll a Perception Check. Um, <laughs> and I, I literally wrote it while I was, somebody was running a D&D one shot for me. And it was very much just like, everyone roll a perception check. This is what you see. Like, oh, you don't see what's in the room. And it's kind of like, this game is just everyone roll a perception check. And it's just based off of like reacting to um, what you perceive. Anyway. Oh my um, God. That's it, so but it's, I've it's, so many yeah. words. Love it. Um, <laughs> I, I, I forget the level of satire that I often put into these little games. <laughs> right? um, like, oh, people who are not like deep into tabletop gaming. And so it's very funny because I'll talk to my brothers, both play um, tabletop RPGs. My one brother is like basically only D and D because that's what his friends play. The other one is mm-hmm. like starting to branch out and stuff. And we'll get together and I'll talk about things. And it's like, oh, there are people that are just casual players that just like sit down and are like, cool, a game. <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> you know, like in my third years and any judge, I've been making this podcast for five years. Like Ryan and I are designing a game. I'm like, oh, there are people that just like sit and like play them they don't like think That's critically it. and like make notes of like mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah mm-hmm. yeah <laughs> and, and i think that's why I'm I'm really happy and I'm really proud of of spell uh, spell the RPG um, because it is a very accessible game. It's a game kind of design where um, I, I'm happy that it has been a lot of people's first RPG and it's gotten people into RPGs that never thought that they would be. Right. Um, spell is. Uh, accessible in a way that it's not really forcing you to uh, be critical about the ways in which you're critical about the things that you're critical of when you're being critical, right? That that, that kind of loop. Mm -hmm. And so in these smaller games, it's really fun to like um, kind of explore that space more. One of the things I think about is sometimes with uh, lightweight narrative games, uh, finger quotes, um, a lot of times they can feel more accessible, but I actually think that a lot of times they rely on a structural knowledge of TTRPGs and how TTRPGs work and like some of those ones where like uh, the card and prompt games where you like mm-hmm. you pull a card and it asks a meaningful question like somebody here is lying to you like why and how do you know like that so sort of, I love those games but I love those games because I've been playing games for so long I've played right. those games with people who haven't and it's like what is like what is this? What do you mean? Like, yeah, how, I know. How can I we... yeah, no. and it's really fun. I played um, for the queen with my mom and my sister, and they they'd yeah. never played a, an RPG of any kind before. And I sat down and I mm-hmm. played it with them, and it was it was really fun to watch because like at first you'd like pull the card, and I'd be like, okay, here's the you know, um, and then they would kind of look at me and be like, okay, and then like they'd pull their card and they'd be like, well, how much can I do? And I was like, you can do whatever, like. But it is, you do forget sometimes that, like, sometimes rules light games are really rules light because they depend on the player to already have, like, an, an understanding of what rule what rules are implied, right? Yeah. That, like, yeah. people who haven't played, it's not really rules light, it's rules implied in some cases. Right. And, yeah, yeah, but it is really fun to see games like this one that are, like, they're not implied, but they are sort of, like... You know, like we're playing with the expectations of the rules that you have. You know, like what are your expectations about those implied rules? Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I, I think, yeah, I wouldn't necessarily pitch this one as super accessible um, in terms of like if somebody who has never played a TTRPG before is picking it up and this is the first game, I bet they could play it and have fun. Um, I think somebody who has been playing TTRPGs for a while would be able to explore that space in between mm-hmm. that um, the the kind of how do we fill in because the, the game asks you to do 10 milestones um mm-hmm. and honestly when i was rereading that i was like I, I might change that to be instead of like 10 2d 10s um because you set the difficulties um uh, i can probably like tweak that probability instead of uh, it's probably going to be seven steps with 3d 10s uh mm-hmm. because probability wise it still shakes out really nicely um there are fewer steps because when you're sitting there writing out 10 different steps and you're thinking ahead of like what is this mission even going to look like if you haven't played or seen or just like have a wealth of that media in your head yeah. um already that can be challenging mm-hmm. um 
So, I mean, that, I mean, that's already a space where I'm thinking like, I should probably reel that back because it's putting too much expectation on that players. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I am very critical of my own games. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I do that. I, I reread games like, oh, this is terrible. I should change this. Um, right. but you've also had one of those that like, I always feel like a lot of criticism comes from the love of something that like we've talked to Ryan and I have talked a lot about like our, some of our favorite games. Like we know that there are lots of problems with them. And part of that mm-hmm. comes from the fact that we love them so much that we can find all of those little places where we're mm-hmm. like, this yeah. doesn't quite click, you know? So mm-hmm. that it's like, there's, there's something about loving a thing where you're like, I see all the places where I, where it could be better <laughs> just because mm-hmm. I've, you know, because I have invested so much time into it. Yeah. I don't remember what the original question was. Hopefully I answered it. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. We just asked what was unique about it. Oh, oh which, okay. Yeah. Lots of things. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and here's where we normally would do a Wikipedia dive into uh, an established game. Uh, but uh, we've got you here with us, so we could just ask you. Um, mm-hmm. When did you start developing this game? When did the game jam happen? And how long did it take to go from start to release? Um, probably a couple of weeks. Um, <laughs> uh, hey, let's see. I am like baffled at people who can do a game jam. Like I have an idea for a game jam that I'd love to do, but I'm like, I can't come up with a game in the amount of time that a game jam would happen. Like I can't, um, how do people's brains well, do that? Discuss. So there's, there's a couple of different ways. I like doing it. Uh, I like building my mechanics from scratch because I genuinely enjoy that. Um, a lot of people see that as uh, reinventing the wheel each time because mm-hmm. a lot of times I think of, well, what if the wheel was a little bit different? Um, but uh, so I, I do really enjoy, I've tried doing hacks before um, where like you take an existing system, either one of my own or, or another system. Like I, I've even done a, a Powered by the Apocalypse game and I, at the end of it, it's like, mm, it's, is it powered by the apocalypse still? Maybe. I right. Don't know. Like at what I, point yeah. of hacking something <laughs> have you, yeah. Yeah. Your, yeah. your um, ship that is no longer your original ship anymore. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, so when, even when using a system, I often end up with a Theseus TTRPG at the end. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, because I get enjoyment out of that. I know a lot of people who do a lot of jams sometimes will have uh, an OSR. Um, uh, that is a TLA that I don't remember exactly what it stands for. Original, no, open source rules. Um, Something like that. I've never figured out exactly what OSR stands for. I just know uh, it's, it's like. It's OSR. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's um, OSR. <laughs> SRD is the other TLA. Oh, yes. Also, that is, um, uh, oh gosh, source. Source rules document. Rules document. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yep. it's, yeah so an get, OSR, SRD, yeah. Uh-huh. This is another yeah. one of those that, like, we're, we're in too deep. We don't even need the, like, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They're all, we don't they're know all what three it letter stands acronyms. for anymore. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, on on co-host, I've, I've been musing about a game that I want to make um, called uh, TLA the RPG, which is about three-letter acronyms um, <gasps> and just kind of like reverse engineering. Like you start out um, as agents of uh, the FBI, Federal Bureau of Investigation, but by the end, you're agents of the FBI, which is like frantically uh, – bludgeoning uh insomniacs or something like that (laughs) yeah yeah. like as someone who works in a job who like one of the like we call them cooperative groups one of the groups that i work with its initials are nrg and nrg stands for nsabp rtog and gog which then stand for like national radiation yeah no it's an acronym made up of other acronyms yeah Mm-hmm. It's just acronyms all the way down. Right, that's right. Awesome. And that's just like one of the things that I work with. And yeah, like, and of course, like we'll use terms that are like, you know, CTMS and everybody's like, oh yeah, I totally know what that means. And then like, I will use them with other people and they're like, what? Or like, it means something like DOA. It means delegation of authority. And I use that like yeah. every day, but, but that's not what everybody else thinks DOA means. <laughs> like, Yeah. Uh, well, like, and that's the awesome thing too, where uh, jargon outside of its context can mean very different things. Mm-hmm. Um, I think uh, one of my favorite examples of that was when I learned that uh, there's like a, a lifting uh, tag on uh, that, that created a lot of confusion between um, 
like weightlifters as well as shoplifters. Uh, they were comparing oh. like how much uh, of a load they were bringing in and that sort of stuff. And <laughs> do you even uh, lift, bro? The weightlifters <laughs> stocks for five finger discount. Yeah, the the weightlifters were upset. They're not even lifting heavy stuff. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! They're not even putting it back down after they lifted it. <laughs> okay, but like if you if you do create that game, please let us know because I'm here oh, for sure. Sure. Please call um, us. Um, <laughs> uh, I could have been using this time to more effectively look to see. 2001 is when I did this game jam. I am pretty darn sure that it is um, by. Uh, it was hosted by Lucky Newt Games, um, mm. who uh, Laura is just an awesome person in the TTRPG space. She's got like a, a, a server and she does a lot of these um, jams and she's been uh, doing this this uh, format that's very cool. You have a game jam that runs for a certain amount of time and then once it concludes, all of those uh, games get gathered up in a bundle, and then the bundle can go for sale. Um, oh. And it's cool because you have this pre-built bundle of games fitting a similar theme, of mm-hmm. a similar scale, similar scope, because they're all kind of created for this jam. Um, but then you also kind of get this almost immediate return on investment where like, Hey, I just made this game. I don't know if it's going to get any sales, but it's going into the bundle. So I might get a little bit of kickback and that's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, and, um, I have been, that's been a, a very cool thing. Um, but 2001 was such a long time ago. Yeah. Uh, usually the jams run for, a comfortable amount of time, uh, mm-hmm. several weeks. Um, but uh, I am a procrastinator. Uh, so a lot of times I just kind of throw it together at uh, last ish, last few <laughs> minutes. Not the last, I, not I the understand last minute. The, the crunch time productivity increase is like multitudes more than you can ever predict. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Everybody knows uh, that too. Like, that's, you know, what I was like, I, how many of us have had teachers in our lives that are like, if you leave it till the last minute and you're like, I'll get it done faster? I don't understand like, what he's trying to tell me. <laughs> you know, like, there's a running joke in like every ADHD group that I'm a part of that it's like the only way to get your house clean is to invite somebody over because like mm-hmm. you will do it then because now there's a deadline <laughs> like, yeah. and it's yes. true it's true it's a hundred percent true yes yeah I wrote my my like capstone project in college like the night before absolutely I did <laughs> yeah I wrote all 35 pages of it like the day before it was due that's yeah, fine easy. that's amazing <laughs> and I graduated with honors thank you very much there you go <laughs> That's awesome. Procrastination. Take that, elementary school it, teachers everybody. everywhere. I but will later. never learn my lesson because <laughs> it works. Right? <laughs> Life lessons from Character Creation Cast. <laughs> the, the, the other aspect of it is uh, I put it together quickly. I, I put it out there. Um, and then... I largely haven't touched this game in about two years uh, mm-hmm. and, until like you, you mentioned it and I, I popped it back open again. That was my first thought. I was like, man, that thing is like, I made it in Canva. So it's like, what, two pages maybe? It's like, it's a postcard front and back. I'm like, oh no, it's actually, it's got some heft to it. It's, it's got some real mechanics. Page. Yeah. 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 Um, and uh, you're and, like, who uh, are these people and did I write a game? <laughs> yeah. It's just, you know, sometimes you just wake up from the fugue state and you have like 30 well, plus games that you also have a baby. Your so like your whole life is kind of a fugue state right now. So yes. <laughs> <laughs> we can't blame you for that one. At least. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Um, before we dive into like actually doing this game, um, mm-hmm. do you feel like there are any terms or concepts that people might need to know to pl- follow along at home or do you feel like well, a lot of people are like, no, it's pretty self-explanatory and we'll do it as we go. But we like to ask. Um, I don't think I have a ton of jargon that I thought to in- set out ahead of time yep. okay. to address in a situation That's like fine. this. So uh, happy to address it as it comes out. <laughs> yeah, we I can think do it. The, I mean, I, I'm using pretty standard jargon of like, uh, mm-hmm. if you're looking at the chart, you're going to see A, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, J, Q, 
K. Um, those are obviously the playing cards. I'm using symbols for the, the suits. Um, D10 is a 10 sided die, those sorts of things. Um, I, I do try to get in the habit of even in the small games, like, once I start using just D10 and stuff like that, I'm like, oh, this might be somebody's first game. I should probably say the D10 means a 10 sided die, that sort mm-hmm. of stuff. Um, just like those little moments of like, oh, yeah, in case this is your first game, right? What are you doing here? But yeah. also, welcome. <laughs> right? How did you, how I'm, is this glad, your first? But, okay. Uh, yeah. I mean, statistically speaking, it's unlikely, but here you mm-hmm. are. So right? <laughs> welcome. welcome. Exactly. <laughs> glad you're here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Uh, well, should we get into it? Should we make some people? Let's make some people. Let's make some people. Let's, Let's do, do it. it. I'm so excited. All right, Taylor, what do we need to do first to get ready to play this game? Um, so for the types of characters, um, and it's, I think you could probably take the opportunity um, to kind of talk about what level of uh, theme that you're going for while it uh, imagines a sort of um, dark comedy. Uh, I mean, there's a certain amount of levity coming into this uh, you know, grim, dark dystopia. Um, mm-hmm. Establish your safety tools, uh, talk about your setting, narrow down the specifics where it's left blank, or leave them to explore later. That's totally fine, too. Um, and then there are... Actually, how many are there? There's one, two, three, four, five. Does this make good content? Just counting yeah. six, yeah. seven, <laughs> eight. Uh, there are eight uh, character uh, types. Um, each one is kind of like a, a broad category, um, mm-hmm. but they all have the same abilities. So it, while I am perfectly for both like, I have to be the medic because our team doesn't have the medic, as well as let's all roll bards and then we can be a touring band. Mm-hmm. I, I I think there's space for both. If there is duplication of character types based on the card hand options, I think you're still going to see some variability, but I think you'd probably get more out of it if there wasn't duplication. But again, mm-hmm. once the game leaves my hands, it's it's up to the players. Yeah. So if you yep. all want to play as Abominables and you all have the same set of powers, cool. You're not breaking I, into our yeah. houses and yeah. telling yeah. us what to do. Yeah. <laughs> have, have fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> Usually, if, if, for the sake of the show, we always kind of pick different things just because we like to show off all the options. Yes. Um, yeah. But yeah, I can see being just like all abominables would be fun potentially. Okay. Yeah. You're just a bunch of uh, like uh, yetis rolling through town, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and you have one very specific way in that you solve your problems. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, <laughs> Nothing wrong with that. No. We have a specific set of skills and it's just <laughs> biting and grappling and slashing. And, yeah. Uh-huh. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so can you go through uh, the different character types uh, for us with a little like blur about what each of them kind of represents? Yeah, happily. Um, so each character has this uh, intro text that um, is a little bit lengthy to read each one. So I'll just do a summary of it for, for our purposes here. Um, but they're a lot of fun to write. Um, <laughs> and then each one has four abilities. Uh, and each of those four abilities are linked to uh, the suits of the deck. So when you play a card, um, even though you have access to all of your abilities all of the time, um, the power that is the one more or less responsible for accomplishing or making progress towards the action that you're making progress to, that's the one represented by the suit of the card. Mm. Um, and then each one kind of, uh, so, um, hearts are usually more social skills, um, spades, um are usually more physical skills diamonds are usually more mental skills and i think the clubs are the kind of like unique to that um archetypes it's called archetypes in this game that's one of those <laughs> things, like i try not to reinvent those words where like each game like they're it's ar- archetype classes playbooks whatever you want to call them it's it's that um i will say yeah, that's to, one of the like i have so many weird like ticks about games but the one that always gets me is like reinventing the word for the person running the game mm-hmm. like it's yeah. like you know like gm dm whatever but like i've started as i do my ennies reading to keep a running list of all of the different names because some of them are just <laughs> they're out there and i love yeah. them yeah yeah and it's great um <laughs> i so i almost 
almost exclusively use GM because I like game moderator. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Because that makes sense to me uh, because mm-hmm. most of my games don't play, take place in a dungeon. Um, and uh, Master is weird. Um, I think <laughs> yes, if somebody yeah. wants to be a master, uh, they can. If they want to do it with my game, sure. But that's not my business. It's between you and um, your players, friend. <laughs> yep. Um, game moderator makes sense. Right. Um, it, it kind of like evens the the, the power dynamic. Um, mm-hmm. But no, I came up through, I did a lot of uh, World of Darkness and they had Storyteller. And like, I like Storyteller that it kind of has that imaginative story thing. But mm-hmm. like, also it doesn't make sense because we're all telling the story. It's all right. collaborative. Yeah, the players are also are, storytellers. Yeah. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and there's it's I fun. There's just some unique ones out there. I'm trying to remember off the top of my head like what they were, but over time there's been some there's been some real fun. Every ones. now and then it is fun to have something that's like deliberately goofy. Yeah. Um, I do I think like referee unique. has been one of my favorites so far that just like okay. Interesting. Or um Monster Hearts uses MC Master of Ceremonies. Yes. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't need to, but you did, and that's right. great. You went there, and I'm happy for you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, the archetypes. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so each archetype has this description. It's, it's pretty broad. It has some examples. It has some a little bit of lore that you can play around with, um, mm-hmm. and then these these four abilities. And so that's kind of what I was saying. If you're all abominables, you all have these same four abilities, but depending on what cards you have, somebody might have more hearts um, mm-hmm. and therefore using that ability more than somebody who has more diamonds who would be using that ability. So eh, that mileage may vary. Yeah. Um, and so the abominables... Uh, alphabetically we're starting with them uh are described as beasts of wild cryptids uh, cryptids of old and polar bears addicted to sugary soft drinks and furious over the destruction of their home um so yeah you can be uh, the yeti the bumble like from rudolph or you can be the uh coca-cola polar bear um now on a rampage because uh there's too much microplastics in your melting home um yeah and so they have uh the otherworldly howl ability, which they can speak in tongues outside of understanding. Uh, they, they, they know the old languages, uh, brute strength, obviously, um, and horde of ages, uh, where they they kind of have their monster cave, uh, where you have just gathered different things. So it's resources oh, nice. available to you. And then claws and jaws. Usually you're going to have natural weapons, natural tools like that. There are critters and critters are, um, Animals that are just like magic animals. A uh, smarmy fox, a charming bunny, an out-of-season songbird who sings like an angel and swears like a sailor. Um, <laughs> there's a... Uh and they have the ability so the soulful eyes that's kind of um there's a, a polish christmas tradition that um animals can talk on christmas eve and so you have to be out of the house on christmas eve um so that they can plan and have their discussions and if you overhear it it's like bad luck or something like that oh. um so and and i think there's just like a lot of like your magical dog or like the the cat that's along for the ride um or uh the the penguin um oh gosh what is his name from santa claus is coming to town the claymation ones a lot mm. of those the, the that claymation the santa claus is coming to town um rudolph and to a much lesser extent little drummer boy <laughs> but those ones also are a big part of my childhood so they do kind mm-hmm. of like inform um some of those those archetypes Um, So you have soulful eyes where you can communicate without words, Uh, nimble majesty where you can uh, you have dex uh, dexterity, uh, grace, natural Mm -hmm. wisdom. You know, you're an animal, you're nature wise Um, and fabled purpose where since um, animals are so often archetypes in fables and and folklore, usually you have a um, kind of like larger, almost like Jungian purpose where like. You are a trickster, so you can do this sort of thing. So it kind of plays mm-hmm. on that. And then elves are uh, – many elves have a complicated relationship with Santa Claus, who some claim was a particularly large elf himself because of their close involvement with the Christmas empire. Uh, even with Santa Gone – oh, yeah, this one was – this elf is on the shelf about. is this. Yeah. yeah. So this, mm. this is uh, mm. one of the mm. descriptions too that, that – 
I think I uh, made like a typo. I have like half a sentence like, oh, I got to go in there and change that. Um, so hopefully <laughs> if you're listening to this and you're checking out the PDF, I have already made that change. And this sentence <laughs> makes sense grammatically. Um, but <laughs> essentially you uh, – this plays a lot on um, labor unions. Um, there's even uh, mm. United in Song, um, where you work together. There, there's strength in um, teamwork and cooperation. Uh, the tools for the job, you have physical tools, um, usually like hammers, chisels, things like that at your disposal. Empire lore, you more than anybody else have a very like specific knowledge of the Christmas empire, the history of Christmas, mm. and how those things uh, happened and interacted. Mm. Um, and then uh, toys and contraptions, you can do little gadgets and little like uh, wind up toys to uh, accomplish things. Oh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, there's frosts, which are uh, kind of like ice elementals, either like a quirky Jack Frost sort of things or like mm -hmm. um, Snowman from um, the movie Snowman. You know, what was that? The, the, the kid's Frosty dad the dies. Oh, and, well, it was Jack Frosty the Snowman. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The much more famous Snowman. Yes, Thank but you. Also, yeah, yes, the but there's Jack also that Frost live movie action. where he becomes a snowman, right? Yeah. Like With, the kid's dad uh, dies. Jack Nicholson? Or, Is it no, Jack Nicholson? It was, no, it was uh, Michael Keaton. Right? Yes, it was. Yeah. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> they made two of your Christmas you movies. You can't trust me to know anything about anything pop culture related. Yeah. <laughs> There's also probably been like half a dozen horror movie variants on that mm -hmm. as well. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so you um, – there's Willful Mischief. Because a, a lot of times there's kind of like a, a mischief inherent in those characters as sort of like uh, whether it's um, uh, Frosty kind of being childlike and whimsical or like the Jack Frost nipping at your nose, that sort of uh, mm -hmm. theme. Frigid Winds, you actually get ice elemental powers uh, linked to the old spirits. Um, and so a lot of these, they're different ways that you're kind of accomplishing the same sorts of things. If it's a social challenge, this is how your character is kind of going about having this social interaction. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, snow folk, uh, structurally dubious, but unquestionably loyal snow elementals can be incredibly useful allies. Love it. Um, yeah, it's I love that one. Army of snow elementals. <laughs> Absolutely. Snow folk. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, <laughs> ghosts. Um, Christmas classic. Um, What's Christmas without a couple this, ghosts, honestly? Exactly. Yeah. Well, like, and this one's a lot of fun, too, because I think this is where the, the Canva aesthetic really plays well, because there's mm -hmm. this really cute chibi ghost. Um, and the description is death transcends time. And so, too, do these vengeful omens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Ghosts carry the unfathomable weight of mortal regrets and shame. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where where do you think the spirit of Christmas comes? It's for right, ghosts. yeah. Specifically, um, so this does spirit. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so these play uh, into a couple of different themes. So it's both the um, like Marley uh, ghosts of Christmas, uh, past, present, and future. There's a little bit of like death transcends time, so you can mm -hmm. see visions of things that happened. Um, as well as things that haven't happened yet. Um, but it also plays with um, It's a Wonderful Life, uh, mm. a Christmas classic that also has to deal with ghosts and angels. Mm -hmm. um, so that you are uh, a ringing bell away from becoming an angel is uh, some of their, their options. So they have an angel's light, which uh, it suggests that you um, – preface using that ability with be not afraid because it can be a little bit intimidating um haunted chains you know you have physical chains that are dragging you around and you can use that kind of ghost writer style because mm -hmm. chains are cool um past present and yet to come you have though that's your your knowledge ability where you can kind of see things that happened are happening might happen um and then slip ethereal which is just you know if you're gonna be in incorporeal you got to have the benefits of being incorporeal yeah i love it so it says the be benefit from the perks of being intangible mm -hmm. that, yeah i would love yeah. that that sounds great <laughs> that's a daily life skill that i need uh-huh uh there's reindeer which i kind of took the ap approach to this and, and what i referenced before my my favorite christmas meme which is from rudolph it's uh the uh, weaknesses will be uh punished unless they're exploitable so they they have this 
history of being the eight tiny reindeer. They're ostensibly descended either genealogically or just in legacy from these reindeer. Mm -hmm. Um, So you have that very close, and similarly to elves, you have that very uh, close connection. But what I wanted to do instead of doubling down on kind of what the elves got, um, I wanted them to be a archetype that can really reinvent itself. so their options are, uh, Hark, your arrival is nearly always perceived. So when you arrive, you can kind of set the mood of the the emotion. Are people excited? Are people fearful? Are mm. you like, is it like the little hooves on a rooftop, uh, excited sort of feeling? Or are you like the fifth horseman of the apocalypse sort of thing when, when you show up? Mm-hmm. Um, Beasts of Burden. Um, this is carry up to approximately one eighth of the weight of all the toys of all of the children of the world. <laughs> approximately uh, you don't one have eighth. to do the math. Yeah. <laughs> approximately one eighth. Uh, I, I, you don't get out your calculators, but like you're pretty strong. Also pretty fast, but I think that goes without saying. Mm-hmm. But their their kind of uh, cultural knowledge skill is a new history, which really allows the player to have the agency to kind of come up with whatever it means to be a this descended reindeer because that original line was like distorted and separated and because you have that sort of past you can kind of reinvent yourself and i honestly that's um one of the things that i kind of wanted to talk about like when it's it's alluded to but like when there's a history of violence um what your responsibility is as a person who is kind of like descended from the people and still actively benefit from uh the 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 cycles of violence what you choose to do to um confront that that cycle of violence but also Mm -hmm. um uh earth reindeer yeah um (laughs) I, I I like to include messages, but it's also this is a, a silly Santa game. Is it that profound? Mm. <laughs> and then of course you have antlers, um, which are effective for goring or generally tossing somebody around like ragdoll. <laughs> like oh, the magic of Christmas and reindeer, and you know, also effective for goring. Okay, like yeah. on this page well, like, with this yeah. cute little reindeer wearing a scarf at the top, and then it's like antlers, <laughs> effective for goring. Yeah. Okay. Well, like, I love and, this and, and so kinda, much. <laughs> and that's kind of one of one in the history for like, because it's, it's the, the two abilities right next to each other in new history, which does talk about that. And it talks about what it means to redefine yourself as a cultural, uh, culture that has benefited from violence in the past. Mm-hmm. And, and then also you have antlers. Right. Um, <laughs> Just a reminder, <laughs> you do, yeah. you are still a reindeer also. Yep. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> the then there are the, the last, um, Christmassy um, option is uh, sweeties, which um, they are uh, gingerbread people, uh, nutcrackers, toy soldiers, gumdrop fairy, uh, gumdrop fairies, uh, <laughs> sexy coffee gajinkas. Um, I, <laughs> those, you know, when people like draw the like human versions of food or like human versions of, mm. of, of things like that. Yeah, it's just. There's a space for it, I guess. Um, <laughs> I like other versions of things. Um, it's it's like, um, this is a little bit of tangent thing, but like when people make character sets that are based off of the Zodiac or something like that, or based off mm-hmm. of the tarot, like this is a set of characters that are based on this random category of thing. Mm-hmm. I think that's so darn cool. Um, mm-hmm. And it's, uh, sometimes it's uh, sexy coffee kajinkas. Mm-hmm. Call them what they are, just don't call them sweeties. And that's something where, like, I needed a word for what this category is because mm-hmm. they have very similar things. But I imagine these characters themselves hate being lumped together like this. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you you have a little bit of that. Um, I could totally see a nutcracker being like, excuse me, I used to be a five-star general. Do not call me a yeah. sweetie. <laughs> right? like- <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, I slew the Rat King in a grisly war. Right. Uh, <laughs> I am no one's sweetie. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And, and so their ability is they have innocent visage, uh, which they look cute, but they are not necessarily. Um, small soldier, uh, whether, you know, you're using... Um, your your magical pop cap gun or a uh, sharpened candy cane, you know, you you are capable. Dance of Destiny, which is uh communicating your your own self through that sort of like figurative mm-hmm. uh language. And then Unliving Vessel, 
leverage the opportunities granted by a body that, though destructible, is inorganic and can always be put back together. So, yeah, kind of indestructible in that way. Uh, and then go. lastly, you can play as a human. Uh, and it's uh, kind of like, why? Mm-hmm. But, you know, you could. Um, their their <laughs> abilities are moralized um, because they're really good at summing up the reasons why we're all doing this. Violence. You as a species are very good at large scale violence, but often struggle with it on a personal scale. Mm-hmm. Um, taxes. Um, you know a lot about things that don't matter to supernatural creatures, but do come in handy in missions. So it's not just literally taxes, but like I, I have this image of, you know, if you are a Yeti, a Christmas elf, a reindeer and a frost spirit, and you're trying to gain access to a skyscraper Mm -hmm. and like, you don't have key cards, but the human would be like, why don't we take the elevator? And I was like, yeah, that makes sense. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, so sometimes in the human world, a mundane solution is the answer. Uh, and then lastly, uh, believe. Um, sometimes things are just stronger when you believe in them. Um, and I did kind of want to end on that little bit like, oh, yeah. yeah the, the, like, nice. you know, what was it? Elf, where they had, to, they had to get the dad at the very end. And like Santa's sleigh meter needed to, to, to rev up. And you just need one more person to sing along. Mm-hmm. Right. I yeah. yeah. It's, it's schlocky, but it's fun. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, the the eight character types, uh, abominals, big snow creatures, critters, like talking animals, elves, elves, elves. Uh, frost, like snow elementals, winter elementals, ghosts, hmm. uh, reindeer, uh, a little make of them what you will, uh, and then sweeties, which are like uh, tour soldiers, gingerbread men, your little gumdrop fairies. Um any given character from the Nutcracker, mm-hmm. and uh, then humans. You can play the uh, the token um, normal person or the kid that gets whisked up on the journey. The, the true um, monster of them all, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, like, and, and part of that too is you know your the the audience placement, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Or like, and while you're on the mission, like your mundane things that you do, though you don't get super strength, they kind of shake out to be as useful, even though mm-hmm. objectively you are not. But like when you do a thing, it is what needs to be done in that space. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and it's kind of like a larger application of game balance and uh if not equally powerful character types equally interesting yeah. character mm-hmm. types um not everybody needs to be able to do the same things but ideally everybody is able to contribute meaningfully in equal proportion yes. mm-hmm. call to action yeah like that i love this game it's a, I it's a lot of fun love like getting to cover just kind of a, a you know a Christmas game, and yeah, this one was perfect. And I love that we got to play in like Goldpend again. Yeah, well, we won't find out about that until next episode. But we've been teasing it. Okay, actually, you can edit incessantly. You can edit that part out then. Oh no! Oh no! It's it's no! It's spoilers for next That's next fair. week's That's episode. That's fair. That's something for everyone to look forward to. You're right. Yeah. I never know where we cut things. <laughs> 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 we actually haven't gotten into character creation yet, yes. but we learned about the game and all the cool things on here. The, this game is it's it's got like a wonderful dark humor. It does about it that I really enjoy. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, just the tagline for the game. I was like, we got to cover. Right. Right. <laughs> I think too. I well, I will say this. I love this game. I love our character creation. We have great discussion. And mm-hmm. you have edited all of it already. So if people, you it know, is. maybe perhaps want to hear the rest of it right away, they could uh, yeah. become patrons. And it is you know, all up on our Patreon get, right get now. That, so. uh, yeah. Just a thought. <laughs> it's a really just, good you know, series. Just, it is a really good series. And honestly, Taylor was a fantastic guest. Had some amazingly insightful discussion about game design and playing games in general. Um, it, it's... I, I just love the series altogether. It was it was a lot of it fun. It was, yeah, yeah. I can't wait till we hear everybody hears what we made next. Oh week. yeah, it's good. It's good. <laughs> it's yeah, so good. It's so good. Before we let you go for the day, though, here's our calls to action. 
this will be our last update regarding the Starcrossed expansion currently crowdfunding right now called Love Letters. There's only a couple days left of the campaign as of the release of this episode, and there's some really cool stuff going on with it. You can get yourself a physical copy of it as well as I Have the High Ground, uh, covered previously on the show in a two-part spotlight episode. Um, along with the deluxe edition of that game, uh, which has some really cool tokens, dice, and a dice bag to hold it all. Uh, but the Love Letters expansion itself has offerings for from so many fantastic designers. Uh, they've been highlighting features uh, and writers and artists uh, on the project, as well as a whole bunch of other stuff throughout this campaign. And it's really been a lot of fun to see that all unfold. So uh, if you're interested in a one, two, three, or more player romance RPG uh, with a bunch of cool scenarios to play and new rules, uh, you'll definitely want to check this out. Uh, link will be in the show notes to that. And if you want more convincing, James D'Amato released an episode on One Shot where he played the solo version of Love Letters oh, cool. with himself. Yeah. Uh, which which just sounds like a blast. Yeah. So uh, definitely check that out. Next up, it's approaching the holiday season. And what better gift to one of your favorite shows than either a review or a Patreon membership? Either way, you'll get something in return. And that is both our appreciation and a shout out on the show. But if you are a patron of the show, you'll be able to get access to all sorts of goodies like dice, stickers, bonus episodes, weekly chit chats, and more. Um, if we can get to the $200 mark, then we can start offering discounted plans for yearly memberships, which would be really nice. Um, mm -hmm. Every little bit does help. So even a dollar a month would go a long way um, if enough of our listeners were to join in. Um, we are aware, of course, that the holiday season is expensive okay. too. So our show will always we will always put out as much content as we can on our main feed. But we do have really cool dice and stickers and stuff too. We do. So, you know. <laughs> um, but we always thank every one of our patrons personally, every episode, like we are about to do right now with Lieutenant and DJ G to Granosaurus. Thank you for believing in us. Many thanks to Eric Bonds and Daryl Holiday II. Shadim Cabal and the Shyest Barbarian, thank you for your continued support. Benjamin Sweeney and Lorcan McInnes, we appreciate your support. Thank you. Thank you to Rob Fletcher and Kevin Brown. Tentacle Duck and Cole McCallum, we're happy to have you here with us. Thank you. John Adamus and Orville's occasionally operatic octopus only operating on the ongoing oceanic tour of the Otherworldly Otter Orchestra. Thank you for your support. <laughs> I did it in one. I, did, did I just it. want to be clear. I did it in one. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> very proud of you. Carlos Salazar and Eric S., many thanks to you. Ross Kingston and Ian Popmeyer, thank you so much. Sorry, Goth and Liam G., you rock. Thank you. Thank you, Brian Colm and the Garden GM. Your support brings us so much joy. Dark Mirror and Tom, we appreciate your support. Thank you. Blue Kryptonite and Danny, our deepest thanks. We appreciate your support as well. Nicole Trainer and Liam Murray, thank you. And finally, Kenning and Brian Kurtz, thank you for your continued support. And thank you to all of our future supporters. Your support not only means the world to us, but it's also allowing us to keep doing the show as it pays for our recording, subscription, Dropbox, editing software, and so much more. If you want to join this growing community, please drop by patreon.com slash character creation cast and at least give us a follow. The follows are free. It's true. But we also do have a free trial for the $5 level if you want to check out some of the bonus content that we do have. So uh, you can't go wrong either way. Yeah. That's, no matter. It's a good deal. <laughs> no matter how you join us, uh, we would love to have you here with us. And, you know, as always, you are more than welcome to leave a review um, on Apple Podcasts, mm -hmm. Podchaser, and Spotify, right? And Podcast Addict, if you oh, want. Yeah. You could also leave a rating on Spotify mm -hmm. uh, if you listen on the app. And obviously, we read, we read all of our reviews on here, too. And, you know, the, it's a great Christmas present. Just saying. If you, if you don't That's know what true. to get your favorite podcast host, <laughs> you know, 
Generally, reviews are Reviews it. are great. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That is all for today's episode. Next week, we get into the true heart of the episode and create our truly inspired characters. Mm-hmm. Until then, take care, everyone. Stay safe out there. Drink some water. Enjoy a seasonally appropriate treat. Uh, stay warm if you live somewhere cold like we do. Um, and keep making those amazing people. We will see you next time. joining us for part one of this character creation series. We'll be back in part two, picking up right where we left off. Character Creation Cast is a production of the One Shot Podcast Network and can be found online at www.charactercreationcast.com. Head to the website to get more information on our hosts, this show, and even our press kit. Character Creation Cast can also be found on Twitter and Blue Sky at CreationCast or on our Discord server at discord.charactercreationcast.com. I'm one of your hosts, Ryan Bolter, and I can be found on Twitter and Blue Sky at Lord Neptune or online at lordneptune.com. Our other host, Amelia Antrim, can be found on Twitter and Blue Sky at Ginger Reckoning. Music for this episode is used with a Creative Commons license or with permission from the podcast they originated from. Further information can be found within the show notes. Our main theme music is Hero Remix by Steve Combs and is used with a Creative Commons license. This podcast is owned by us under Creative Commons. This episode was edited by Ryan Bolter. Further information for the game systems used and today's guests can also be found in the show notes. If you'd like to support our show, find us on Patreon. Get access to bonus episodes, exclusive merch, and much more at patreon.com slash character creation cast. Thanks for joining us. And remember, we find that the best part of any role-playing game is character creation. So go out there and create some amazing people. We'll see you next time. Mm